Good evening. Good morning, depending on when you're watching this. Welcome back. <laughs> Hoops fans <laughs> are under the radar. Oh, well, I'm sure. What? Under the radar. Oh, damn it. I'm your host, Chad Sherwood, joined by John Stalika down there, right below me, Rocco Miller from bracketeer.org. That's it, right? Hey! <laughs> what? You forgot oh, about David. me again. Yeah. And David. and David Griggs, of course. Yes. Um, this is our Under the Radar podcast where we take a look at the 22 Under the Radar conferences. David, can you tell us what it means to be an Under the Radar conference? Yes, it means you're essentially, well, there's two qualifiers, one in the biggest and the only one that's mattered for the last couple years now is uh, you're not one of the 10 multi-bid leagues. The 10 multi-bid leagues are just that, the ones that typically send at least one or two, at least one team inside the bubble. They typically send multiple teams to the tournament. That's the five power conferences, the ACC, SEC, Big Twin, Big 12, and Pac-12, along with the Atlantic 10, the Big East, the American, uh, the Mountain West, albeit not very often lately, and the West Coast Conference. Uh, the other disqualifier is if you are ranked in one of the human polls, like the AP or the Top 25, you are by definition on the radar and not under it. And that applies to absolutely zero teams. This right. Year, and, last and it's, year, yeah. Maybe and, next year. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what we do like to do is go through these 22 conferences, see what's going on in them, uh, go over any news and notes from those conferences, take a look at anybody that we think may have a shot at potentially getting a uh, at large bid to the tournament, uh, should they yeah. slip up in their conference tournaments. And we like to start with a feature conference of the night. And tonight yeah. we have a feature conference that, uh, well, past few years we've had a few conferences that really have had some crazy close standings all year long. Leagues like the Colonial and the Big South have been just wild all season. The Big South, yeah. The Big South is one of the great ones the last <laughs> yeah. couple of years. Again this year, we'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, Rocco, I know you're out there on the West Coast. The conference has not been like that in the last few years, to my best of my memory, it suddenly is. Here's the Big West, and there's their standings on the screen. It's a mass chaos suddenly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been very chaotic. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, it, the, the conference has actually came up a, a level this year. Last year was probably one of the worst years ever for the Big West. If you follow the Ken, the Ken Palm uh, conference ratings, they were 29th out of 32 last year. Uh, I don't even think they've had a year nearly that bad. Um, but this year they're back in the top 20. I think they're number 19. Um, there's just a lot of uh, – it, it's a great league to follow because uh, when you go on the road, it's very hard to get a road win. There's only two teams that have done it three times. That would be Cal State Fullerton and Long Beach State. But even in the example of Long Beach State, they beat the three worst teams on the road. So you got to figure when the other top teams get the opportunity to play – Riverside and Northridge on the road, they'll pick up some wins as well. Um, additionally, that uh, playing into that home court advantage, you've got teams like UC Davis who have a 19-game home court winning streak going. You've got uh, UC Santa Barbara who is 9-0. and If they can beat Hawaii at home tomorrow, they'll win their 10th in a row uh, at home and tie a school record. And then we all know about Hawaii's great home court advantage that got a little bit exposed last week. Um, so, Overall, I think it's going to go all the way down to the wire and maybe even three or four teams in the hunt. But what's real um, strange here is one of the reasons you don't see UC Santa Barbara at the top of the standings. Cal Poly actually knocked them off at their place at the beginning of the year. Yeah, this has always been a fun conference. Rocco mentioned how bad it was last year, and it was uncharacteristically bad. Uh, this conference has had teams end up on the 15 line before, but it's typically when – a, one of the weaker teams gets hot and wins the conference tournament. Uh, the team that's at the top of the, of the conference is typically 12, 13-ish, uh, maybe 14. And um, I think it's a little bit closer to that this year, although as you can see there, no one exactly running away from it. But I, I, for those of you that, that don't really follow the conference and maybe just watch it under the radar, I, I don't I, – this league, I'm not going to compare it to a power conference, but these – programs are well supported these are really healthy rivalries these atmospheres are really good like uc davis long beach santa barbara uh hawaii of course all of them irvine these are these are well supported programs and like if you went to one of those games or watch these games it's like man they, they get a pretty good atmosphere going in there oh yeah 
Yeah, I've, yeah, I've actually been to a game at the at the pyramid in Long Beach, and it gets it gets crazy in there. Uh, yeah, so you're definitely right about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a real fun league, and uh, and Morocco. What do you see now that coming out of this league now with this 16 grouping there within a game of each other in the in the lost column? Uh, I mean, t- especially a team like Irvine who did nothing non-conference among those teams. <laughs> <laughs> well, Irvine, you know, they're, they're competitive, so you can't overlook them. They've got a brutal week coming up. I think they're on the road against uh, possibly the two best teams. I think they, they have the black and blue rivalry, I think, is tonight, um, as you guys featured today on the site. It's happy to, happy to see that. Um, so they'll be, at, they'll be at Long Beach State. And then later this week, I think they're at, uh, is it Santa Barbara? Or, oh, sorry, oh, oh. Cal State Fullerton. Yeah. Exactly. So um, what I'm seeing right now is I honestly just I, I test wise think UCSB is the strongest team and they've got the most going for them. They would also have the highest potential to get a 14, maybe even a 13 seed if they got on a hot streak uh, outside of USB. Cal State Fullerton has really established themselves uh, in great position because they've got two key road wins, including a huge one at Hawaii last week, and they have five more home games coming up. So Fullerton has got the best position. UCSB's probably got the best talent. And then everybody else, of course, is still in the mix in this top five or six. Yeah, and it should be just a great season going ahead. There's the, the rest of the week's schedules on the screen there. Including you already mentioned that, that big Hawaii UCSB game tomorrow night uh, involving two of the teams with only two losses. Uh, Davis, a couple of road games as well coming up yeah. at Northridge and at Long Beach on Saturday. Another, another game between two of those four teams that are tied at the top there. Uh, could yeah. be a real fun second half of the season here, though. Really should be. And this conference tournament, is it once again in Anaheim? In Anaheim again, yes. Top eight teams yeah. make it. So, uh, Polly and Riverside also <laughs> Why battling. not just take all nine, for Christ's <laughs> sake? <laughs> I mean, why not just have an eight-nine cool. game? <laughs> uh, no, somebody's going to get left out, uh, either Polly or Riverside, most likely. Yeah. Unless Northridge completely collapsed. I think the uh, puppet is still hell-bent on getting a quintuple header in Anaheim. Is that right? Well, quintuple headers are wonderful things. We haven't had one, I don't think, since the big, the 13-team Big East. But it was wonderful. It was five games in one session. Uh, Conference USA two years ago had a 14-team format. One of the teams was ineligible. I think it was Southern Miss. They had 13 teams. We lobbied them. Remember that, Chad? We were calling the commissioner's yes. office trying to get them to do the quintuple header. They wouldn't do it. The A-10 never did it either when they had a 13-team format. Uh, although um, we do got to give a little bit of credit to the Metro Atlantic, who has done not even a quintuple, but a sextuple header when you include the women's and men's games in the same day. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, but I got some news on that, men's so. games. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, the, the Big East quintuple header, it, it started at noon and it ended at one in the morning, and it was fabulous. It's the best. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a look through some of the other leagues here. Let's, let's roll back over to the America East now where uh, Vermont, uh, I think they also picked up a win tonight that did not show up on the screen. I thought it would. Maybe I've had some scoreboard problems. Yeah, they won easily. Uh, yes, they've been winning them. easily. Yeah, uh, they've been winning easily all since, all through conference play. Very, very dangerous Vermont team. Well, Here's the upcoming schedule there. Vermont at Binghamton tonight. That game has gone final. They did win it. Uh, interesting te- road test, though, coming up on Saturday, John. They're at UMBC, uh, who has looked like the second-best team in the conference. Uh, maybe their toughest road game of the season. Maybe the trip to Albany they've got coming up. One of those two, the, definitely. Uh, if they're going to slip up, this may be the game, though. And UMBC also survived a tough test on the road tonight at Stony Brook, which – was the first time they had won there in a few tries. So this is definitely going to be Vermont's biggest hurdle as far as potentially running the table in conference play. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping it's a good game because the last time it was a little disappointing when they went to Vermont and, and it wasn't a game right off the bat. So hopefully UMBC is ready to take them on. Yeah, and Vermont was without Anthony Lamb, but when the first matchup between these two teams also. So it's not like they even can right. say Hey, they had Lamb in that game. They don't have him now. Um, yeah. Right. In the A-Sun, Florida Gulf Coast, another team that just uh, just keeps winning games here and, and has is now 8-0 in conference play there, David. 
Yeah, and again, you don't want to start counting this early, but with six games remaining, they have a two-game lead, so you got to figure four more wins. And they, they've they played Jacksonville once or twice, I can't remember. But they're about – well, they're four wins away from, from absolutely locking it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in the in, – yeah, that Jacksonville game they played on Saturday, it was a really good game. I think it was yeah, tied it was. with a minute or so left. and. That surprised me because talent-wise, Florida Gulf Coast has has a surplus of talent compared to Jacksonville's roster. I think Jacksonville's got a, a, a maybe one or two guys that can score, but uh, it, it just shows that Gulf Coast can really fall apart defensively <laughs> in certain cases. Yeah. Uh, they're just all about offense, and they're one of the most exciting teams uh, in the entire country to watch, let alone under the radar. Um, so for entertainment value purposes, it's probably best you know for the majority of fans out there that they – find a way to get into the tournament and uh but lips this lipscomb team is starting to bounce back yeah yeah uh the other night one of many 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 overtime games on Monday, it was, <laughs> I, that was the greatest night it's been a while since i've had that much fun in the regular season because we were all getting ready for uh the hoops hd report so we were all online and everybody seemed to be watching all the games it was just a great night maybe the best ever of under the radar basketball it was amazing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, so we'll get to that Sienna St. Peter's game in a bit because that was a, a a real real game. But uh, uh, yeah. here, uh, Gulf Coast Jacksonville round two is actually coming up this Saturday as they begin the second uh, trip through the team second the second time. And uh, Gulf Coast. Oh, was scratch that, it! That like, so game. yeah, Gulf Coast is three wins away because if they get that when they got a three game lead yeah. with seven, yeah, and which means they'll have the tiebreaker. So. Gulf and, Coast is actually getting very close to wrapping up home court here. Yeah, yeah, and it's only a yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's a, it's a fourteen game schedule, uh, so there's only six left to begin with for right. them. And then, and then the the last Lipscomb matchups actually in Fort Myers, so mm-hmm. they're they're definitely clearly in the driver's seat. Yeah. Uh, where do we go next? How about? Uh... Here we go, John. How about the Big Sky? We talk about another team that's roll continues to roll through its conference. How about this Montana team, again a two game lead uh, in their conference? Yeah, I would hope they would be rolling, considering they have the easiest double as far as Southern Utah and Northern Arizona goes. Right now, it's Eastern Washington has also entered the fray as far as uh, challenging challenging them along with uh, Weber State and Idaho. But as far as the aforementioned Eagles, they picked up nice wins at home against Northern Colorado and North Dakota. Um, what has happened to Portland State? This was a team that had a fantastic November. Uh, unfortunately, December, January, and it have not been so good. No, they haven't. If you look, they still have the third best RPI in the conference, but there they are, three and five. In right. Play, and it's just – uh, barring a run in the conference tournament, they may have to do it out of a out of the eight seed. They may have to play an opening round game in the conference. They will most likely have to play an opening round game in the conference tournament. Uh, yeah, as long as they don't f- finish fifth or worse there. Right. Uh, but the up the upcoming schedule here for the Big Sky Montana on the road at Northern Colorado and at North Dakota this week. So it's a little bit of a, a couple of road tests here, at least for for the for the Grizz up there. Yep, and uh, but again, uh, even if they drop one of those, I still think they're in pretty good shape. They, they've looked really good so far. Um, coincidentally, uh, have you ever tried? Like, have you ever tried to watch like those Idaho games on whatever the hell TV package that is? It's best just to go to the Big South website, public service announcement. There's a better link with a stream that doesn't go dark every thirty seconds. Yeah, Pluto TV. Pluto. Oh lord <laughs> it, it, it's it's the new streaming site for the big sky which always had some fairly weak quality streaming to begin with uh this was a mistake by the conference yes. a mistake. make a deal with espn3 make a deal with the net with something like stadium uh you get some quality streams hey, this blue we'll stuff. send rocco out with a smartphone <laughs> let's do it <laughs> i'm in <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Rocco, you got you got you got uh, six games for Thursday night. Can you hit them all? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I would love to. Can we start them at uh, nine in the morning and end at one in the morning? I think I can do <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, but BigSky.TV, actually, I actually did find live streams on there, and they were working. So you didn't have to download the Pluto thing. and you, it, Don't mess with Pluto. It's not worth it. I, I'm sure the Big Sky loves uh, this uh, uh, criticism, but who what the hell do I care? Uh, we still, oh, we mentioned them at the top of the show here, Rocco. We were talking about how cra- conferences with crazy uh, standings, but here they are, the Big South. Five teams within a game of first place. And in high point, you go six teams deep in this conference. Uh, yeah. Liberty, I think, was a pretty good team. There they are in seventh even. It's uh, wide open again. <laughs> it is. And the, and the funny thing is, is Radford lost to Charleston Southern <laughs> at, yeah. at home. So, <laughs> yeah, <it> was... <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I wanted to come out and say, unlike the Big West, who I think really has six teams that could win that auto bid, this league actually – probably at maybe a seven, but maybe even eight with Charleston Southern showing their ability. Longwood actually got hot for a week or two. So who knows? Maybe we should just open it up to Presby too and uh, say well, it's well, a Well, don't forget, Pre- Pre- Presby had that huge non-conference win against UNC, a very good UNC Greensboro team. Uh, yeah. One of the most exciting calls of the season. Back the- <laughs> one of the games yeah. of the year. One of the games of the year for sure. Oh, God. <laughs> that was so, uh, so awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 entirely unpredictable. I've tried to predict this league on multiple weeks, and I consistently fail. Uh, there's a lot of games coming up here Thursday, Saturday, and and next week they play Wednesday. So we got we got 15 games on this on the screen there. Uh, John, what are you looking forward to here? All of them? <laughs> yep. Also, trying to see if even a team like Liberty can uh, make another move with uh, Windsor coming into town, and and they also make trips to Longwood and Charleston Southern. So yeah. they're probably not going to challenge for the regular season title, but certainly getting back towards the possibly the top half here. Saturday is uh, Radford Winthrop, I think will be the, probably the yeah. best game on here. Uh, yeah. And that one's, well, I mean, again, they're, they're tied for first place along with half the conference, but um, <laughs> I mean, that's going to go a long way to, to deciding who gets to host the conference tournament. And, I, I mean, we, we, we used to – well, we always say it, we will continue to say it. When you play at campus sites, it adds stakes to the regular season that the Horizon League used to have and no longer has and that, that this conference now has that they didn't used to have. That's a big game. That, that Ramford-Winthrop game is really big. Yep. Let's uh... – Let's jump over to the Colonial, and this is the other conference we mentioned. Here's a three-way tie in first place now in the Colonial. Charleston, Bill & Mary, Northeastern, Hofstra, even Towson, and Elon still in contention here. Uh, David, we did see Towson beat Bill & Mary this week. Uh, we saw um, – we've just seen a lot of good games in this league, quite honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's in one sense, it's been great. It's been kind of unfortunate because we thought that, like, College of Charleston – uh, and maybe even a uh, Hofstra could run away from it and maybe play their way inside the bubble. That went away a long time ago, I think. But the good side is that we've seen a lot of exciting and competitive games. Uh, tournaments in Charleston, it's at a predetermined site. Again, like we just said, I'm not the biggest fan of that. But, it, I mean, still some pretty good games going on here. <laughs> and... Uh... And you're the luckiest team in the, in the country here in this conference with Bill and Ma- William and Mary. Uh, we'll see if that luck holds up because they've been very unlucky in the Colonial Tournament, especially when they've had some really good teams the past few years. They're still stuck on that short list of now four teams that have been members of D1 since its inception. They've never made the NCAA Tournament. Yeah. So uh, maybe they I'll can finally this. break through. Yeah, I'll say this for William and Mary. When they lose, they do not mess around. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is the week you have to look at College of Charleston because it seems like they're finally starting to win some games away from home, and now they get two major tests with uh, Northeastern and Hofstra looming. Yeah, if they get both of those, they should they should be able to put them, some distance between themselves and everybody else. Yeah, absolutely huge week for Charleston coming up. Uh, but uh, Rocco, let's take a look. Here at uh, take a look here at Conference USA, where we've uh, we're kind of form kind of held and everybody just kind of won this week. Not not much exciting news in terms of the scores, was there? Well, I thought the Marshall Western Kentucky game was really really well played. I think Marshall led a lot of the second half, and Western Kentucky 
uh, tied it up with about three minutes left. And then Marshall never scored again. Or maybe they scored two points. Uh, but that was actually a really good game to watch. Um, outside of that, um, a little bit less important, North Texas FIU was a great game. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that was the, the real only significant action was WKU Marshall. Um, but, the, I mean, this is, this is probably the premier UTR conference this year just because we have some at-large potentials here. I mean, I was looking pretty closely at Middle Tennessee earlier today. Um, you know, they're not out of it for an at-large, I don't think, because no. if they can, uh, you know, get another win against Western Kentucky, they've got a really great RPI. I think they're number 23 or uh, top 25, I'm pretty sure. Um, I, you know, you can't count them out. If they lost – if they beat Western Kentucky, uh, let's say on March 1st, and then lost to Western Kentucky in the finals, they're going to be a hotly debated team going into the selection Sunday. Even I would a team like uh, UAB seemed to be a bit of a sleeper, but they kept hitting the snooze button against Texas San Antonio and never yeah. woke up in that one. Right. They've been yeah. kind of disappointed pointing this year but I, I agree with Rocco I, I would like to think that the committee would take them and I'm still kind of salty at what they did with Wilmington and Middle right. Tennessee a year ago when I thought they clearly had profiles uh, especially when you looked at the road games they won now they weren't beating the top 50 teams and maybe that uh, maybe that's changed a little bit now that they've done the team sheets differently but right. these are teams that went out and, and won on the road against it places that are really hard to win at. And I would like to think that if middle beats Western Kentucky twice and loses to them in the final, you could say, well, they beat them twice during the year. They didn't need to do for a third time what they had already exactly. done twice. I'd like to think the committee would take them. Uh, both teams – and that's the other thing. The overall strength of schedule for both Western Kentucky and middle is pretty good. Uh, Old Dominion, a team that I kind of had written off as funny as that is after they lost at home to Western Kentucky, that's their only loss. And their strength of schedule is around 3,000 or whatever it is. It's pretty bad. It's not as bad as Georgetown. But, uh, yeah, you, you know, they're, they're really good too. So you got three really good teams that if they play their way into the semis, whoever comes out of that is going to be really dangerous. And well, Dave, maybe Dave, more than one gets in. David, let me ask you this. Let me ask you the reverse of the thing when you just said about Middle Tennessee. Let's say Western wins the final matchup of the two at Middle on March 1st. Then Middle wins the conference championship game against Western. Can Western get in with an at-large bid? They have the I, I they have been good, but look at those four quadrant four losses. That, that That's the problem on Western's profile. It is. Um, and, and, again, at Whiskey, although they got absolutely robbed in that one, and, and how – tragic would it be if that ends up playing a role in keeping them out but I, I mean I would like to think the committee would look at them it's a healthy RPI they so. you know they did beat SMU away from home they wanted Old Dominion and Marshall I think those teams have a combined total of three losses two of them are to this team and um you know the win at Austin P is is actually not looking bad now <laughs> uh, yeah, I, kind of, I, I would point to the middle sweep of golf of two games against Golf Coast before I point to the Austin P win by Western. But uh, that's just me. <laughs> Austin uh, P's just a game out of first. In the well, we'll get to the OVC here in a little bit. Yeah, uh, Chad and David. What I'd like to just mention is if either of these teams get to that point and they win out from here, let's just besides that matchup on March first, uh, let's just imagine we uh, we're in that situation. What what the committee has shown over the last twelve years or so is that the key statistic to, if there is one, to separate bubble teams is non-conference strength of schedule, which uh, Chad just had it pulled up. Right now, oh, Middle God. Tennessee is number four in the nation, and, and, um, and Western Kentucky is number 21. And that, if you look at some of these other bubble teams right now, is a huge outlier. Like, if you look at Virginia Tech, they're close to 300. Kansas State is 330. Uh, I think uh, Boise State's 175. We've got a, a couple teams floating around the bubble right now that are 270s. I mean, these teams are going to completely stand out in that department, and you don't have a lot resume-wise to compare, so it really will be a key tiebreaker. So I'm really I, I interested – we can yeah. get to that stage and have that conversation. I hope you're right. And I would have, it just seems like for the last two years, now yeah. I know that Monmouth, there were reasons not to take them uh, two years ago that I think they had three losses outside the top 200, but their out of conference schedule was amazing. 
It, it was a lot better than than Jesus Tulsa. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah, and I think a lot of this new model is hoping to make sure they don't make that mistake again. Yeah, we can only and, hope and, for the best. They can easily screw these teams over. No doubt about it, but I, it, there has been a consistency there that no team I, – I read a stat, no team over 250 non-conference strength of schedule has been a 10 seed or higher. So if they're really? going to get in with that – yeah, with their, uh, since Air Force, I think in 2004 when they were a 13 seed. Um, so if they're going to get in with a 250 RPI, when I'm talking about VTech, K-State, some of these other teams in that range, they're going to need to be a 9 seed or, or above just based on historicals. Um, oh. so, Interesting to think about. And do you think, and again, I know you follow this probably more closely than, than the rest of us do, but do you think when Greg Shaheen left uh, that the under-the-radar conferences got a little bit less love and it became top 50, top 50? I, I mean, last year I was convinced that that's all they did was count the number of top 50 wins. Yeah, they I didn't mean, look at how hard it was to maybe beat the 80th team on the road when that team only lost one or two other home games. Well, it's Whereas under Shaheen, I think they did. What's David, that? let me jump in here. I, th I think that's one of the things that this new quadrant or tiered uh, team sheet is doing is trying to point, bring the attention to, hey, a road win against a 75 is is in the same ballpark as a home win against you know, a, a 30 even. It so, is. It, it absolutely and, is, yeah. And, and it now <laughs> is with those new team sheets grouped together. So maybe we're going to get more recognition of that this year than we have the past few years, yeah. at least hopefully. Hopefully, uh, but yeah, and, and, and you can convince me of that, David. I, I, I mean, there's no way we're going to be able to prove that either way, but it sure feels that way. And, yeah. And I know a, another big criteria is just playing, even if you don't win them all, just playing a lot of road games. So when you look at like Michigan State or, or a team like that that only went on the road once or, or maybe not, not even at all in non-conference, that's actually going to really hurt them because um, that, that's also been a tiebreaker. And I know these mid-major teams, especially middle and western, have gone away from home quite a bit before the conference started. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, just let's get rolling through the, some of these leagues again here. Uh, just note that conference USA, yep, big upcoming game coming up tomorrow night. Uh, Middle is at Old Dominion. That's their oh, uh, huge toughest. That, that, that's the game that Middle's got to get through if we want these two teams to win out until March 1st. That's probably the biggest chance for either one of these teams to go down here, uh, just looking at these schedules. But uh, John, let's over to the Horizon League. You had a chance to go and check out Wright State in person, I believe, this past week. Did you not? Yeah, that was for their uh, Sunday game against Oakland, and it was pretty apparent to see that even though Wright State lost a couple key seniors from last year, they had uh, three freshmen waiting in the wings, and uh, one of them, the name is escaping me at the moment, Loud and Love actually had 18 points and 17 rebounds in their win against Oakland. He actually had a double-double at halftime, and thanks to uh, NKU also losing a game against Oakland, Wright State is back in the driver's seat as far as the race goes here. I guess my only thought when I look at this conference, David, is I just think Oakland is a sleeping giant, and I think that that's a team that if you have to ask me who's going to win the conference tournament, even out of a four-seed spot where they are right now, I would still put my money on, on, on Oakland. Well, you don't think – I mean, it's going to be hard going the right state to win that. Uh, oh, wait. They, uh, never mind. <laughs> they all, they're also have the home court advantage being in Michigan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, unless, they, unless they get a matchup with Detroit, they'll have a home court advantage. I'll put it that yeah. way. How many games has uh, Oakland won in uh, Detroit in this new incarnation of Horizon? Zero. Zero. But <laughs> But how uh, – again, good job, Horizon League. So if Wright State finishes first, they're going to be playing a semifinal game at – you know, th that's what happened to, to Monmouth the last couple years in the, in the Metro Atlantic, having to play a semifinal road game as the top seed. Good job. <laughs> good job. Yeah, congrats, guys. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of Wright State's week up ahead here, Bronco, they're at Cleveland State and hosting Youngstown, so it should be a fairly easy week for the Raiders this week. Agreed. And, um, I, you know, I, I wanted to pay attention to Friday's game with Illinois-Chicago and Oakland. Illinois-Chicago, out of their last eight games, they've only lost once. They won the other seven, and the, the one loss was to Oakland. So, you know, they'll be hungry to try to steal that one. 
All right, well, uh, let's move over, moving on over to the Ivy League, uh, where we have finally, after this week, got gotten through the uh, through the partial conference play section of the season. We're going to have everybody play two games per weekend here on out until we're done, uh, plus an extra Penn Princeton game to come, I believe, next week as well, though. But David oh. Harvard kind of bouncing back oh. from a disappointing conference at 4-0, and right? Yeah, kind of bouncing back. Loyola just missed a shot at the buzzer that would have won. The, we'll get to the Missouri Valley here in a second. But, yeah, live uh, on tape delay. Live on tape delay. But uh, Harvard was a team that we were expecting a lot out of, uh, you know, top 40 good. And they have been maybe top 400 good if that. But here they are getting four conference wins. Uh, is their ceiling – I know that they're not going to get anywhere near the tournament without the auto bid, but – is this a potentially dangerous team? Because uh, is their ceiling still a top 40 ceiling? I know you were even bigger on them than I was. But, uh, you know, where was this before now? I, I don't know. And Rocco, maybe, Rocco, maybe you have thoughts on that. But I, I think this Harvard team is just, you know, beating up on some pretty weak Ivy League competition, and that's it so far. And, and we may, they may start falling apart again when they get Penn and Princeton. Yeah, I, Chad, I'm I'm more on your side on that. The, the the Yale game last week, it's a good win to win on the road and such a great rivalry. But Makai Mason is still not healthy. Um, I think he came back for a game or two and then he missed that one. Um, so obviously Yale's a much different team without him. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 uh, you know I, I I'm I'm still giving Penn the nod uh, based on being the most consistent team. But I I would if I had to bet on anybody, I'd bet on Princeton to to uh, be the number one seed. And here is the upcoming schedule. You see, we do have, in addition to everybody playing Friday, Saturday, like we will do throughout the rest of the season, uh, we have that bonus Penn Princeton game coming up on Tuesday. Uh, Stalika, you, you think that that's, that could be a key game here and determine who the one seed is in the conference? Well, it could also be pivotal as who's going to be that, either the two or the three, because remember, Harvard's already got that the half game lead. But if Brown or Yale can uh, pick off a game this weekend, that could also be huge as far as who would be the fourth team in among that group as well. You're right. Brown and Yale at the Penn, with the Penn Princeton road trip this weekend. Uh, if we get a single upset there, it could, could definitely change the standings here. Mm -hmm. Rocco, the Metro Atlantic. Um, should we talk about what happened Monday night? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you called on me. Uh, and, and I think that we, got, we got two games to talk about because we also had we had an overtime game between Fairfield and Iona that ended in triple digits. And we had a triple <laughs> game between Siena and St. Peter's that that if you took the over in the game in Vegas, you still lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm I'm I feel I feel lucky to be called on them for this conference. So. Um, I, I, uh, I happened to just be tuning in at the beginning of the St. Peter's game uh, for no other reason than me and a couple of friends back home uh, do a, a daily competition where one person chooses a game and we put a, we put a friendly pick in. And the, the, the guy who chose it chose Siena St. Peter's. So I was like, all right, I got to watch this. And it was unbelievable. I couldn't <laughs> believe I, – I knew St. Peter's had an, has one of the best defenses in the country. Their coach is really known for it. Uh, but to be that low scoring was, I mean, you have to try to, to be that bad. It was, it was remarkable. And then I had the Fairfield Iona game side by side. And I think at one point they were in the mid eighties in that game and they had just hit the thirties in the Siena. So it was truly unbelievable. Um, not to mention the other under the radar games that you mentioned earlier that went into overtime at all at the same time. Yeah. It was, it was chaos. Absolutely. It was. <laughs> we also had another remarkable fact that Chad pointed out at the beginning of triple overtime. St. Peter's actually had more timeouts than they started the game with. <laughs> right. Yeah, five timeouts. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, oh. was, this, was, this game was tied at 40-40 after 40 minutes, at 45-45 after 45 minutes, at 50-50 <laughs> after 50 minutes. <laughs> it, it was yeah. – it, it was – 
<laughs> crazy, yeah. David. Absolute crazy. We yeah, didn't get a win. quadrupler, but this one might have to get honorary mention with the other two that we've had uh, <laughs> because it was just so, so crazy. <laughs> and, and I got to say uh, the other thing now, David, this is the longest we've ever spent at the end of January speaking about a game between the ninth and 11th place teams in any under radar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going deep under the radar. <laughs> Did you guys see Jimmy Pastos, uh, his shirt after the game? <laughs> I, I wish somebody had a picture pulled up. It, it looked like he played. It looked like he played. It was unbelievable. <laughs> well, uh, by the way, Ryder is now nine and two, uh, although still tied in the loss column with Canisius, but has, has played two more games. And here's the upcoming schedule. Uh, Ryder is at Quinnipiac this weekend. Uh, While well, Canisius is at Marist at St. Peter's. So road test for top couple of teams here I, I, on that end of the conference john what is it riders now your team to beat i'm still keeping an eye on uh Canisius, but the metrics would certainly fall in favor of a uh, rider here yeah I like rider yeah. uh, rocco you have a little bit of news about the metro atlantic tournament yeah so last week they played a uh, triple how do i believe it was at nassau Col- uh, coliseum out in long island yes. and the reason the reason for that is um, it sounds like the rest of the conference outside of Siena is upset with the uh, conference tournament location being at the Pepsi Center every year in Albany. Uh, uh, amazingly, it's... Siena doesn't have an issue with well, it. They did not have an issue. <laughs> so they use that triple header. I haven't heard the results, Chad. I hope you can maybe update us since you're out there uh, on how that turnout was. I know they had the uh, big Iona Manhattan game there. Uh, but they're also looking at um, Atlantic City. Uh, at the at the boardwalk hall, I believe it's called, um, and this yes. would take a uh, this would take effect in 2019. So it sounds like those are the two finalists. Oh, uh, I got I an really idea. Hope they go with Atlantic City. That's right in my backyard here, and, and I can report live from, <laughs> no, from that'd those be games. Well, but, uh, <laughs> that would oh we we had oh if you missed it we we were live from the Metro Atlantic tournament it's it, the untelevised opening round. Uh, we we need to dig that up and but. Um, I don't know. I got a better idea. Why not play it at campus sites? Well, someone who's been to Boardwalk Hall for a conference tournament when the A-10 was there, I hope they have a fire extinguisher because I remember a Xavier Dayton game getting delayed for about 10 minutes because a a pizza caught fire in one of the kitchen areas. Hey, come on. Uh, Let's move on. (laughs) Let's Yeah. Let's keep going, David. The Mid American Conference. We saw the uh, pretty shocking upset. I thought, at least, when Kent State knocked off Buffalo Tuesday night uh, in a game yeah, that Ru- Buffalo was up more game, and, and Kent just came out of nowhere to steal it. Yeah, I mean, Buffalo was cruising to the point to where there was so much else going on. You kind of changed the channel and uh, just kind of kept an eye on the score. But Kent came roaring back. It was a really intense game. Uh, there was a sort of a dust up. I don't want to call it a fight because that overstates it. At the end of the game, and with 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 a three point difference, I think at least one or two players were ejected. And I remember thinking, how are they? The the margin is three points. How are they going to manage this? Is Buffalo going to get to go to the free throw line and shoot free throws and get a chance to win here? But but they didn't. So uh, I think it was offsetting. Tech, tech, no. I guess you would call it offsetting technicals, and then Kent State held on the win. I real, I still really like this Buffalo team. Uh, their RPI was so high that you had to wonder, do they have a chance at getting selected if they don't win the conference tournament? But I, I think this really, really ends whatever slim chances they had. But, God, their RPI was. I still is. Well, it's, Rocco, I mean, it's they, they maintain – yeah, yeah, they, they they maintain not only their lead in the conference, but they also hold the tiebreaker over Toledo for the one seed. Uh, but it could have been tied up, except the fact that Toledo then lost to a what is now a shorthanded Ball State team. Yeah, um, impressive. I, Taylor Persons, you know, I think I think everybody knows the name now after he had that huge game winning three pointer at Notre Dame in the beginning of the year when Notre Dame was ranked in the top ten. Um, I got to see him in person against Ohio and, and he had another outstanding game, 18 points, eight boards, eight eight assists. But the reason I want to bring him up is that this guy is, 
you know, we used to have the shack of the Mac. I think it was Gary Trent back in the day. This guy's like the pest of the Mac because he gets into everybody's head. <laughs> he frustrates He frustrates the other team. He gets in the lane. He picks fights. Then he backs away. Kind of like a um, – I don't want to say Marshall Henderson, but a little bit of that flavor uh, from back from Ole Miss. Um, oh, so, yes. But, I mean, he really gets under the other team's skin. And I saw that start happening last night at Toledo. And that game was at Toledo. Pretty impressive. To, that psychological effect took too little their, their rhythm because they were one of the hottest teams in the in the country coming in. Yeah, and here's there's the upcoming schedule on the screen here, including Western Michigan Buffalo and a national TV game coming up Friday night. Uh, I think the first game between those two teams was also was, but uh, John. Over in the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, uh, we may have a major story developing here with the Savannah State Tigers ineligible for the tournament on the way down potentially after next season to D2 and tied for first place. Yeah, one of their wins was going to be a pretty easy one against uh, Delaware State, a team that will probably be addressing later on in March. But at the same time, the beat keeps rolling along. If you're a team like a uh, NC A and T, who also beat their in-state rival NC Central at home. Yeah, yeah, but but David, how about Savannah State? I mean, could could this become one of the biggest stories if they could win the regular season title here? Uh, I am going to do everything I can to make it a big story. I, I'm calling everyone <laughs> okay. I know because it, it, and really like. God, I, I just hate that they're on an APR ban because, for starters, nobody that's on the team now is ineligible. Like, nobody playing is ineligible to play, yet they can't play because of people that weren't eligible before. Uh, and I think a lot of that was due to various – it's a low-resource school. I just don't think the monitoring what it was what it needed to be uh, to get the APR where it was. Uh, you would like to see them – be given some sort of reprieve. We've seen it before in some of these HBCUs and really low resource schools. But yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's really a fascinating story. The idea that they're going to be transitioning down after next season or plan to, uh, the, the one caveat to that was minus a substantial amount of income. And yet here they are ineligible on top of looking at transitioning down and they're tied for first. I, I mean, that is, that's crazy. Actually, they're going to be outright in first place in about 10 minutes here. They currently have a 14-point lead in their game at FAMU that's going on right now as we record this. So uh, that's going to be 7-1 at the, at the end of the day. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> congrats to them there. Uh, but let's, uh, let's take a look at a conference I just saw a Big upset tonight, Rocco. The Missouri Valley Conference, not even on the screen yet, but Loyola Chicago did fall by two after trying to make a furious comeback, but coming up short against Bradley tonight. Yeah, and I would I would argue with that a little bit. I I, I thought that was more of a coin flip. Bradley came in eleven and zero, as as John p- pointed out before the show tonight, ten and zero against D one schools at in Carver Arena. Um, and Bradley's got a developed roster. I had a chance to uh, do some digging um, and, and research them. I, I know the last two years have been a real struggle for them, uh, but they've done a great job, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Wardle's the coach there, of not messing around with transfers and just keeping everybody in-house, and it's finally paying off here in year three. Uh, they've got a legitimate team that, that could definitely win uh, the uh, tournament in Arch Madness. Um, they controlled most of the game tonight. I know uh, Loyola made a late rally. And don't get me wrong, Loyola is a great team, one of my favorite under-the-radar teams this year. Um, but I definitely wouldn't call it a, any any real upset, okay. in my in my opinion, at least. Um, and now we've got a pretty good race. We've got three losses for Chicago now. Well, um, John, you're circling Southern Illinois. Uh, you, you, want to, you want to talk about this, Lukey's here? Yep, I mean, they've gotten two pretty significant road wins against uh, Missouri State and Drake. Both the Bears and the Bulldogs were near the top of the Missouri Valley, but both teams seem to have gotten into hibernation of late. Time out. Missouri State has gone completely down the toilet. The Drake win, I'll give you. But Missouri State, I, I've got nothing. I've got no love left for this team. They, they, they can't beat anybody right now. But oh, go ahead, Barry. Oh, okay, John. I, I have a thought as soon as he's done. 
No, go ahead, pop it. Okay, Barry Hansen, uh, the current Southern Illinois coach, former Missouri State coach, a year or two ago, I, I think it was he, he described his team's shooting as we couldn't hit a bull in the butt with a bass fiddle, which is – I don't even know what that means, but I think it's the greatest soundbite I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Uh, Missouri State at Loyola Chicago coming up on Saturday. That was a game two or three weeks ago I would have been circling. I, I, I could see a complete blowout here now, that Brock, with the way that this Missouri State team is playing. Uh, I think, yeah, if you, Missouri State, yeah, that should be a complete blowout. The wheels have, have fallen off. Coach Lusk, everybody wants him out, um, according to social media. And I know it's it was a rough uh, offseason for him, too, to get ready. And all as Johnson, the preseason player of the year. Um, you know, gave the Bears a lot of excitement. They did well up until a couple of weeks ago, and now the wheels are off. So it um, doesn't look good for, for them. They'll probably be looking for a coach this offseason. And um, Loyal Chicago Drake rematch could be good. I'm not giving up on Drake, but uh, reality has started to set in for the Bulldogs. Okay. Uh, David, one of our favorite conferences, the Northeast Conference, and we're yeah. starting to just – Starting to see a team that's that might be ready to pull away up here at the top of the standings. Do you think? Yeah, Wagner. Real we nice like them. Yo, what's that? Mean, but look at what they did this. What they did this week, winning at SFPA and at Robert Morris uh, this yeah. week. Huge, huge, Wagner. Yeah, and, and you know, a real good week for them. They've had a really good season. We liked them uh, as well as about as much as you can like anybody from this conference. Well, prior to conference play beginning, and a very, very, very rare thing here, they have cracked the top 100 of the RPI. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and Joby's Nitty Gritties. Look at that. Oh, oh, wow. So are they maybe looking at not the – I mean, they certainly should be inside the, the first four with that if they can hold on well, and get there. Well, well, let me ask this question. If they don't lose again – until in, win the rest of the regular season, win the conference tournament, and they just passed their two toughest road tests this week. Could be looking at a 15 line, maybe even total. Yeah, maybe. I mean, fourth, they might be I, inside I, the bubble. The <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think you'd be looking at a 15 seed here. Uh, yeah. I mean, they could be. Definitely. Especially when you start to factor in, we'll probably get a couple surprise upsets, maybe team, a team or two with a losing record that gets a bid. Yeah. You know, that'll push them up even higher. And on that note, they're going to go out this week and lose to both Central Connecticut and, and SFBK. <laughs> yeah, Central Connecticut, Don, you know, I mean, you, you know, kind of a good story there, a, a bit of a turnaround. One of the worst programs on the planet, suddenly, at least in the middle of the pack here. So, and da- and Daniel Marshall, the coach da- there? Yeah, Daniel Marshall's yeah. the coach. He's doing a really good job. Yeah. After he had to miss the first, first few games of the season with uh, some school issues, but. <laughs> yeah, he um, did. But, let's uh, <laughs> you know, one of the best coaches in the state of Connecticut. Maybe the best. David, uh, David, I know you want to do an hour or two about Austin P basketball. So now that we're in Ohio Valley, go ahead. I'll go take a break. It's all you. Well, there we go. Yeah, you know, um, Belmont and Murray State kind of running away with things here. And, again, like Chad has it all in one division, but I still think they go by two. So both of them looking to be at the top of the ladder. I still no, like this don't. Jack State team, although not as much as I like Murray and Belmont. Uh, David, I am back, and and no, they they got rid of divisional play uh, in the Ohio. Yeah, so they have divisional play, and um, right. <laughs> okay, never mind then. Um, yeah, uh, Belmont nine and one, Murray State eight and two, clearly a step above everybody else in the conference. But uh, Rocco, here here comes the upcoming schedule. Is there any specific games you're looking forward to this week in this league? Well, Belmont's got to go to that snake pit of Moorhead State on Saturday. And uh, I know they're having a down year, but uh, watch out for Moorhead. You never know. Uh, Moorhead other- must lead the nation in, in games in games lost by fewer than 10 points. It's been but, – But to be fair to Moorhead, unlike St. John's, they're actually winning a couple of these close games <laughs> yeah. at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. They- but otherwise, John, the top two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, for there, I want to head over to the Patriot League where we saw Bucknell swim well, no, out. No, we didn't. Uh, <laughs> Harvey, really well, well, 
No, well, we did for those because of you that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. none of us saw any such Buck. thing. Okay, yes, sorry, go ahead. Awful Jeff. street problems in the Patriot League tonight. However, Bucknell made a nice comeback, forced overtime, ran away in overtime, but did beat Army. Now ten and one in league, and uh, and I guess uh, Rocco, how dangerous is this Bucknell team when we get to the NCAA tournament? Should they get that bid? I think they're I think they're fairly dangerous. I, I you know I, they are just recently fully healthy for the first time, um, and they're starting to play like the team we thought they would be. And I thought they would cruise tonight, so I was really surprised that Army took it to them that way. But give Bucknell credit for not backing down and finding a way to rally and get that win. Um, I know when uh, they're fully healthy, they, they must realize that their superior, uh, su- you know, their, their talent is superior to the rest of the, to the league. And so it's got to be hard at a certain point, especially this time of year, to, to get up for every single opponent. I know conference tournament-wise, they should be sharp. I think they'll play at home. And, um, yeah. and I think they'll be dangerous for a two or a three seed or maybe even a four seed. Of Probably not a four seed. Part of it was probably also an emotional letdown because they did have a, a rather decisive win at the roof on Sunday, which gave them some separation from BU. Yeah, and that was a good – I mean, they looked really good in that game. And watching that game, you're just like, oh, man, this is the team that, you, you know, squeezed Virginia Tech last year, almost beating them. And this is who we thought they were going to be. And then the night – I mean, the rumor was they struggled with Army, although when I tried to log on and watch it, but the rumor was uh, that was a close game. They're going to be hosting Lafayette and uh, and at Lehigh this week. Uh, should be two more wins, although I think Lehigh the first time around is the team that beat them at the start of the season, if, if I'm correct. I think that's right, yeah. No, Bo- it was Boston. It was Boston. Yeah. Was oh, no, Boston. Boston you played. Yeah. But, but one of the – I think Lehigh gave them a real tough, close game that they pulled out yeah. earlier. That, that's when I made the tweet about how Bucknell was hands down the biggest disappointment in all of college basketball, and, and they haven't lost since. <laughs> uh, SoCon, another, here's another undefeated oh. team, uh, John. Tennessee State now 10-0, and coming off of a nice win at Wofford this week uh, and a hard-fought win, but a win at the Citadel. <laughs> Yeah, they were sweating bullets down in uh, Charleston on Monday night, but certainly a couple of uh, misplays by Citadel in the closing seconds certainly helped uh, East Tennessee State here. Yeah, the Citadel had them down for most of that game. It it was crazy. (laughs) One of the things here, very interesting scheduling, Rocco. Uh, You you had those two games uh, that. Citadel game Monday. They're playing again tomorrow night, Samford. They're playing Saturday, Chattanooga. A lot of games close to each other here. Uh, what's that, five games in 10 days or something like that for the, for the Buccaneers? Yeah, and I think it was, it was their third and six on Monday. So, yeah, that sounds right. And at least they'll get the chattanooga Samford games at home, and those are two bottom-of-the-league teams. So as long as they, you know, just, you know, hold serve there, they, they should be fine. Um, and then they go to VMI, which is another easy one. Um, you would think it'd be uh, only, one, only one game to left to really circle in the schedule is that fe- February 12th game at Greensboro. That may be yeah. the, the, the game that decides those, to go undefeated. That could be, but those last two are also tough games. Uh, Wofford and Furman coming into their house. They'll get them at home, but those teams will give them a battle. Yeah. That Furman game was still awesome. It was. Yeah. Uh, and, David, here's the week's schedule coming up. Uh, we, we already mentioned what East Tennessee State has. You also see the rest of the games there, including, uh, I guess, I don't know. Uh, Walford Citadel. I guess the Citadel starts at 6 o'clock when they play at home. I, I, there's got to be a reason for that. But, uh, yeah, that game tomorrow start also starting at 6 o'clock. It's just that I haven't really been watching the Citadel during the week except when they've been playing, you know, the team, the, the top of the league team. So I didn't realize that. but. It, it, who's the under the radar champ that knows the reasoning for that? Because I have no idea why they would start at six. Uh, they like to get to bed early. Uh, okay. That might be it. Here's the Southland Conference. A few other scores that are not on the screen include that New, New Orleans did beat Northwestern State tonight. SFA picked up a win over Houston Baptist. Uh, Corpus Christi won on the road at Southeastern Louisiana. So 
a uh, few scores that did not make the screen there, but we're now going to have New Orleans and Nichols and SFA as the three teams with two losses in this league, Rocco. Yeah, it's it, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a log jam now, one, another one of those log jam leagues. Uh, but I like Stephen F. Austin still. I mean, yeah. they've, they've, uh, they've played well. I, I, like, I also like South, Southeastern Louisiana, but I, don't, I think SFA is just another notch above. When Central Arkansas um, gets on the court with anybody, if, you know, Howard is just an incredible player, he's going to be the best player on the floor, and that gives them a chance to knock off anyone. I think they were the last team to beat SFA. Um, so this conference tournament, when we get to the semis, is going to be pretty good. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, couple of n- notes here. I, like we said, Southeastern Louisiana, you just mentioned, really bad loss at home tonight to Corpus Christi, actually. That's, that's, that'll be Corpus oh. Christi's second win of the season. But um, top of that, uh, only eight teams make this conference tournament, so there are a lot of stakes there in the middle and the bottom of the conference, although it looks like three of them are already kind of locked in. <laughs> yeah. <other things. laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> wow. Well, this is – what's disappointing about this, and, and it's at campus sites now, is it or is it? Is, no, is it, no, it's still in Katie. No, it's not. Katie, well, yeah. the, you, you, what do you see there? You see 13 teams, and they have the ability to have a quintuple header. No, nope, they play an eight-team tournament. They use the ladder just kind of like the OVC yeah. uses. But, uh, right, and I'm assuming it's uh, men's and women's at the same place, so you've got yeah. – it's quadruple headers every day, I guess. Yep. Uh the SWAC, we have a two-game lead now for Arkansas Pie Bluff, despite the fact that on Saturday the dream ended. Uh, I have lo- no interest in this conference anymore. I- I'm for taking their bid away. The dream is right. over. Well, then, then, then really quickly, uh, upcoming games here, Pine Bluff hosting Alabama A&M and Alabama State can get to 10-1. and one. David doesn't care, says we have to move I, on. Well, I, I do. I would like to say this, and, and not disingenuous at all. How about the year Grambling's having? Uh, again, the two, two of the greatest stories in college basketball, uh, Grambling and Savannah State, not eligible. <laughs> uh, actually, coming up Saturday, Southern Grambling, it's a Bayou Classic there, a big rivalry game. Yep, uh, it is. More so football side but John let me bring you in here in the Summit League South Dakota State bounced back from the loss last week picked up two more wins yep uh, easy to do easier to do against the bottom of the conference at least as far as getting wins against uh, Fort Wayne and also Omaha two, but there's two, that was a two point win that's Fort Wayne that wasn't exactly easy yeah. but go ahead <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. Did we lose? I think we lost. Right, but uh, John, is he frozen? Oh, he he, he must be frozen. Okay. Anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, well, Rocco, let me bring you in here. Here's uh, this, this. You know, we we gotta get sleek back. Uh, uh, yeah. South Dakota State hosting <laughs> North Dakota State this week. I think that's their only game. Uh, meanwhile, South Dakota with a pair of games. Yeah, in South Dakota, you know, they saw what happens on the road last week when they got killed at Denver. Um, that kind of came out of nowhere for them. And, uh, South, yeah, South Dakota State should be okay at home against North Dakota State. I'm sure uh, they'll take care of business there. Mike Dom last night, what a game. He had 38-15, and 15, continues to be possibly the UTR uh, player of the year. Um, so, you know, I, I, Summit League – Tremendous year. Ken Pomeroy put an article out about them recently. Uh, they're now the 12th best conference. Um, <laughs> pretty incredible yeah. for, for, for this batch of teams. Yeah, and South Dakota State, for real. Definitely. I think, the top, I, think I, think, I think South Dakota could give teams problems in the tournament, too, if they end up going. Yeah. I think we have John back. So, John, if you're back, you want to take the Sun Belt instead? <laughs> yeah, I know, Chad. Usually likes to hold his breath whenever we get to this part of the show, but it's also worth mentioning that while Louisiana continues their run of perfection, Georgia State and Georgia Southern still continuing to contend as far as uh, getting wins against the 
Texas schools, with the one exception being Texas State actually stealing a win at Georgia Southern. So that keeps them within sight of the Raging Cajuns for now. Yeah, they are within sight, but Louisiana still perfect. Uh, this week, just one game uh, at rival Louisiana Monroe. Uh, I guess the only chance of that is because it is a bit of a rivalry there, David. Did, possible upset, but I don't think it's going to happen. No, uh, not likely. Uh, not a likely upset. Uh, so let's uh, let's turn to the final conference involving possibly the best team that we've discussed all night here, Rocco. How about this New Mexico State team? Uh, not only did they win at UMKC, but last night a huge, huge win over in-state rival Ooh. Northern New Mexico. I was I was thinking about how big of a rivalry that game was. David, <laughs> I don't know if you guys follow the March Madness uh, Twitter account, but they they even highlighted it as one of their top ten plays. There was an alley oop dunk in that game. Uh, you know that uh, they were even treating it as the biggest rivalry game by even adding a highlight to that reel. It was pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, the the win at UMKC in league uh, probably doesn't look like a big deal, but they were missing their best player Lofton for that and still won by 25 on the road in a league game. Kind of shows how deep this team is. Yeah, uh, Utah Valley picked a home win over Grand Canyon, still say, staying right there in second place. Uh, but this week, again, only one game for New Mexico State hosting Rio Grande. Uh, David, you want to call the upset? Uh, no. Uh, no. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there are things that won't happen, and that is one of those things. <laughs> the other thing that we, we do need to quick, quickly mention with this league is that with Mississippi Valley State having pick up, picked up a win over in the SWAC, we are left with only two teams winless against D1, Delaware State from the MEAC and the Chicago State team. But uh, a, a fairly healthy RPI at 327 for a team without a win. So uh, yeah, are they I, really I think they worst team in d1 david no no uh that rpi is too good like their losses aren't <laughs> bad enough to get the centenary well it's the strength of the schedule it's also the killer because they're at 116 which is actually in the top third as far as uh d1 teams go yeah, yeah i mean they really needed to schedule they, they needed to plan this out they killed themselves i think we need yeah. a team sheet on this but chad i think you should really consider chicago state just because that Northwestern game when they were down 44 to five at one point. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty hard to do for two D one schools. It was 55 to eight at one point. It, it was yeah. remarkably bad. And Northwestern all is not good. No. <laughs> they all come down to this March 3rd regular season finale when they host UMKC. Uh, that may be their last chance to get a win with only three home games left. So I uh, want to circle that one potential under the radar game of the day to end the regular season there. <laughs> uh, the team of the people going to be a member yeah. of the WAC next season. There they are, Cal Baptist, a, a solid 10-point home win over Azusa Pacific. And David, game of the season coming up on Saturday. Yes, it, it is. It's, I mean, Concordia coming to Cal Baptist, the that, team of the people. That's, th that's Thursday, Saturday. Oh. Notre Dame. Oh, the, the Notre Dame. Wow. Notre Dame. Notre that Dame. <laughs> Notre Dame. Wow. I mean, <laughs> and a very odd road game there for the Irish going out to Cal Baptist. Uh, yeah, again, they're transitioning up. They they said that for years and years and years, Notre Dame just didn't play anyone out of conference. Really stepping it up here. Uh, Notre Dame at Cal Baptist and John. I need a scouting report for Monday night also. They got three games this week. What is this Academy of Art? I mean, okay. uh, are we going with a little expressionalism, uh, post-impressionistic? Uh, what, what, what type of contest is it? Well, first off, I want to make a small correction. It was actually a road win for Cal Baptist, which is something they did actually need. But as far as the Academy of Arts, I believe they're located in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. So yep. I don't uh, have their it, logo. I don't have the logo in John, front John, of John, the me. fact that you even knew that <laughs> amazes the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, but I want to know, are they playing basketball or is it going to be like an art contest? 
Like who can who can give the the best piece of modern art or maybe some sculptures, Rocco? Well, whatever it is, if they're gonna. If, if, if it's an art contest, the team of the people's in trouble because yeah. you don't want to mess Academy of Art in an art test, art, art contest. Um, but yeah, they're right down the street here in San Francisco, so I had no idea they were in this conference though. That's that's news to me. Uh, but those. <laughs> <laughs> the Azusa Pacific win was um, outstanding because Azusa Pacific set still ahead of them in the standings, and now they have a season sweep over them. There we go. Um, let's do a sub under the radar ten lists. Uh, I think we can yes. do a drum roll here. Number one team, January thirty first, twenty eighteen. Should not be too much of a surprise. It is that New Mexico State team. Ooh, I didn't have them. It is a surprise. Then. Okay. Yeah. Coming in right behind them at number two. It actually was fairly close. Western Kentucky at two. Middle Tennessee yeah. at three. Uh, these may be the only three teams that we're discussing here that have with a serious at-large bid possibility should they win out to their conference tournament title games. Uh, potentially, but I, I, I like some other teams too. I, I uh, like Loyola's, them. This vote was taken before that game went final tonight, but but Loyola Chicago four uh, with a loss afterwards. Yeah, and coming I, in I, for, I think they deserve it at large, and I like this team too. I think they deserve it at large if they need it. Let's, East Tennessee let's State have, have on yeah. the roll. <laughs> oh, Louisiana, love that team. I mean, again, <laughs> uh, solidly inside the bubble, give them an at large. Vermont. Vermont, of course, Vermont, like nearly beat Kentucky. They've been blowing through their conference. Dangerous team. How about they, they deserve it at large? Buffalo, like their RPI is still top 30. I mean, first place team, top 30 RPI, that's an at large. South Dakota State, no. All right. What about number 10 team here, Wright State? Yes. I mean, again, blowing through the Horizon League, they deserve it at large. Uh, our honorable mentions, David. Let's go through them in order. Does Montana deserve an at-large? Of course. Belmont. Yes. Old Dominion. Yes. Savannah State. An automatic bid. <laughs> but not eligible. <laughs> We're inviting them to the AC8. Uh, once again, very disappointed that I'm the only one that put Savannah State on my ballot. But uh, that, that's our top ten list for the week. <laughs> It also okay. I'll save that for the fun of Oh, David, what, what, go ahead. Got you on the screen now. Okay. Well, when you look at those top, I mean, of course, there's probably only three that are even going to be on the bubble, much less inside of it, and maybe none of them are inside of it by the time that it's over. But where we sit now, I, I don't recall a year. I think that after conference, after the out of conference play was over, we were kind of down, or at least I was, on a lot of the under the radar teams. But now here we are going in the February. In fact, most of you are probably watching this on February 1st. And there are more teams that, while not inside the bubble, that are potentially dangerous than what I've ever felt before. Like Louisiana was number seven, and they're damn good. It, 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 Vermont's good. Bucknell, who wasn't even in, or on it, or were they? Did they come in at number 10? They were they're not, not. going to have the paper because it took them so long to get going. But, again, this is a team that, that blew through the conference last year, almost beat West Virginia, and everybody from that team is back. So, I, I mean, I think you're going to see if all these teams get, are able to get through and get the automatic bids, and I realize that's a big if because these conference tournaments are kind of crab feuds you're going to see some really, really competitive 5-12, 4-13, and even 3-14 games this year. And, and Rocco, let me go to you for any other final thoughts, but I, I do want to, before I do so, just really quickly echo what David just said. Uh, if we get these 10 teams that we just voted in here in, uh, they are all dangerous teams. But, uh, but go ahead, Rocco. They are, yeah. And I'd like to build on that because, if um, you know, looking at the other side of the bracket, we've got about – um, I'd go down to Xavier, which might be six or seven, depending on your seed list, uh, as really, really strong teams, teams that would you would feel pretty comfortable they'll still take care of a team like a Louisiana, for example. But you start looking at the seed list, at least at this stage, and you got teams from like eight to 30. You know, any of those teams are going to wind up with the, two, the last two seed and then the three, fours, and fives. And that's the matchups we're going to be seeing for these teams that David mentioned. And those are, I mean, that even creates a potential for these teams being favored in Las Vegas. Um, 
and that's not in a stretch of the imagination. Like if you have uh, a team like in Arkansas, for example, playing Loyola Chicago, I could see Loyola Chicago being favored in Vegas. And so it's a, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's great for the sport. We love the parody. Uh, we wish there was a way these teams could get more at large bids. That's what we all fight for on here. Um, you look at the Ken Palm top 70, there's seven of these teams in there, and that doesn't count WCC and some of those other borderline mid-majors. So um, it's going to be fun to follow uh, as we continue on. All right, John. It seems like we're getting to a point where almost every single playing court is going to be named after either a former coach or administrator. And Nichols State, while they did lose a tough one at home against Southeast Louisiana over the weekend, they did name their floor after Ricky Broussard, who had actually coached there from 1990 through 2002. They did make a two NCAA tournament appearances in that span. Right, uh, David, you want to finish us off? Well, I mean, I would. I, I've already shared all my wisdom with how good the the, the UTR top ten is. Okay. So. Well, I guess on that note, uh, amazingly, the puppet doesn't want to speak anymore. So, on behalf Dark of Web. John Salika, Rocco Miller, Dark David Web Graves, Conspiracy, I'm we're going to talk Sherwood. about that tomorrow. Uh, thanks, Josh. So we will be back tomorrow night. We're going to be doing our a bracket rundown show, a slightly different format. We're going to be revealing a bracket on the air that may or may not be the identical to the bracket that the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee announces in March. It is possible. Uh, so tune in for that, and we'll talk to you again real soon.